Hello, everyone, and welcome to our weekly philosophical talks with Stephen Friedman. Stephen Friedman is the New York Times acclaimed great philosopher, also a scientist and an artist, and also amazing speaker of ours. First of all, we would like to thank the U.S. Consulate General here in Almaty, American Space Almaty, and also amazing speaker Stephen Friedman, and you, the audience, for joining us weekly. Thank you very much. Have a great talk. Please feel free to ask your questions and give your comments. We will address them in the end of our lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aliyah, for the introduction. Um, I'm always appreciative of Aliyah's role as moderator. She is essential to these talks and to making them possible. Um, I also want to thank the U.S. Consulate um, in Almaty, um, Dana, Elmira, um, the entire team and staff that facilitates these and brings a philosophical perspective um, to the world of contemporary issues. Um, a lot of these talks are motivated by the calendar of international days. Um, that was true of last week's talk on International Youth Day. And it's true of today's talk. Um, August 12th, a week ago, was also International Elephant Day. And it's, it's a talk, I mean, it's a topic that's meant to focus attention on not just elephants as a, an endangered species, um, but all endangered wildlife, um, you know, the nature of, of human development, um, the nature of climate change um, threatens, you know, the, the vitality, the, uh, the robustness of many species. But this is not a talk on ecology, it's a talk on philosophy. So I'm interested in bringing a philosophical dimension you know, to the day and to the celebration. When I saw that it was International Elephant Day, what immediately came to mind and what motivated this talk was a quotation that begins Andre Malraux's Anti Memoirs. Now, Andre Malraux and Anti Memoirs are things I've discussed in the past, I've quoted from in the past. Um, Andre Malraux was a 20th century French intellectual, um, writer, novelist, art historian, um, minister of culture under de Gaulle. Um, uh, leader of the French resistance during World War II, a, a celebrated man of his time. He was also the, reportedly, the only person for whom Picasso ever stopped painting when Malraux would visit his studio, because Malraux was such a compelling conversationalist, one of the great talkers of the 20th century. On to and to memoirs is one of his final works. It's um, not an autobiography. Um, it is really a work that, as Moreau describes it, addresses the issues that death raises about the meaning of the world. Well, that book begins with a Buddhist text. The Buddhist text is the elephant is the wisest of all animals the only one who remembers his former lives. And he remains motionless for long periods of time, meditating thereon. Now, let me say a few things about that statement. First of all, it has a number of key ideas, right? The idea of wisdom, the idea of remembering one's former lives. Obviously that's part of a cultural tradition that's specific to certain parts of the world, not so common in, in Western thought. Um, it talks about you know, contemplating you know, these lives. It, it's talking about bringing a set of ideas together. Now, when we talk about bringing a set of ideas together, we are talking about a convergent process. When we're talking about convergence, we're talking about heuristics about processes within heuristic space, unless we're bringing everything together, like a universal 
convergence, which is what the concept of God represents, brings everything together to achieve an existential, an epistemic point. But in general, when we talk about convergence in more limited contexts, we're talking about something that is heuristic and so has value for us, but not to the point of salvation, not to the point of a complete philosophical solution to the world. So that statement, that Buddhist text, is what, from a philosophical standpoint, we would consider interesting, intriguing, mythological, you know, could inspire thought in different directions, but it's not in the nature of an epistemic claim. I like to make the point that in evaluating a proposition, any proposition, the most important consideration is, is it epistemic, incontrovertible, operating at the limit of rigor, or is it heuristic, something that's approximate, that helps us survive, whereas the epistemic achieves the rigor, or achieves rigorously what religions imagine as salvation or enlightenment or mystical union with God, but only at the limit of rigor, of rigorous representation. Well, the if something is epistemic, it's incontrovertible, it's not debatable. If something is heuristic, it's something from which no definitive rigorous conclusions can be drawn. So it's, it's important to be aware of the, the role and the status of propositions philosophically, epistemic or heuristic, conducive to a rigorous solution to the world, conducive to survival, what facilitates the achievement of specific goals. Now, in the case of that image that um, was displayed, of that drawing, of an elephant, that's by Rembrandt. And obviously I could have chosen lots of photographs, lots of images, you know, in relation to International Elephant Day. I chose a drawing by Rembrandt. And, and the reason is Rembrandt is one of the world's greatest portrait artists. And it's often said that no one has greater insight into character, into the character of a human being, into personality than a portrait artist. It's something that I've sort of experienced in my own work. I started out doing portraiture, um, partly to test myself, to see if I had any talent for art at all. And I always imagined portraiture to be among the most difficult of artistic undertakings because there was so much subtlety involved in the execution. And, and I found that the more I did portraits, the more perceptive I became into people's character and personality. Well, in the case of, of Rembrandt and that rendering, there's a sense of the inner life of the elephant. And, and that's one of the things that makes elephants of interest philosophically. It's one of the things that inspired that Buddhist text, the suggestion of an inner life. Now, one of the reasons why that comes about <clears throat> is because elephants are highly social and, and language exists for purposes of social coordination, facilitating social interaction allowing societies, human societies, to foster. It's not the point of language to allow us to communicate our ideas. Without language, we would have no ideas to speak of. But it allows us to coordinate our actions, our behaviors. Well, when we see such coordination taking place within animal societies, we into it, we, we imagine there to be inner life, you know, behind those coordinating actions, coordinating behaviors. The, the sense of a, 
of a rich inner life is something again that helps support our interest in elephants philosophically, religiously, and, and otherwise. Um, there is a Hindu deity, Ganesha. It's not one of the three main Hindu deities, Vishnu, Shiva, um, Brahma, but it's maybe the next tier down. And some people even rank it at the highest level. Ganesha is a deity with the, the body of a human being, the head of an elephant. That's a representation of Ganesha. There are many throughout Hindu culture. It's one of the most celebrated and most worshiped of all Hindu deities. Well, it turns out that Ganesha enshrines success, intelligence, wisdom, and salvation. So within the Hindu tradition, again, we see images of the elephant associated with the highest religious aspiration, the highest religious achievement. In the case of Buddhism, the historical Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, who lived a little over 2,500 years ago, was believed to be, is believed to be, the final incarnation of what was in its previous life prior to achieving the, the incarnation of the Buddha himself, a white elephant. So again, the, the elephant within the Buddhist tradition is seen as leading to the, the very step of the achievement of Buddhism that flourishes in the life and work of Siddhartha Gautama. But his, his previous incarnation believed to be a white elephant. In, in Western culture, the psychoanalyst Jung, um, who devoted a lot of time to the interpretation of dreams. He was inspired by the work of Freud, who was actually a student of Freud's. Um, Freud's first great work that brought him to international attention was on the interpretation of dreams. And Jung's work was inspired by <clears throat> Freud's achievement. Well, now when it comes to dream interpretation, um, this again is something heuristic, not epistemic. One can't arrive at a definitive interpretation of the symbols that appear in dreams, or one can't assign dream imagery you know, to specific anecdotes or meanings because one can't ultimately test those conclusions. But Jung maintained that Anytime an elephant appears in one's dream, that represents the self, oneself. So again, we see how central um, the elephant is in, in philosophical thought or philosophical type thought, in, in psychological thought and in religious thinking. And again, it's, it's not an accident it's because of the impression that the elephant gives of having a, a rich interior life, partly because of its rich social behaviors. Well, there have been scientific studies that bear upon just these issues, especially the issue that Jung was addressing in terms of the elephant embodying the self, or the image of the elephant representing selfhood dreams. Experiments have been done with mirrors and different species of, of animal. And it turns out very few animal species are capable of recognizing 
themselves in a mirror or of, of displaying behavior that suggests such recognition. Human beings obviously do, are most conspicuously you know, able to recognize themselves in mirrors. The, the great apes in general can, but not, not entirely. Like, like gorillas have trouble. Um, chimpanzees, not in general. Chimpanzees can recognize themselves and, and respond and, and respond in ways that suggest a vanity of appreciation of their appearance. Dolphins display behavior that suggests self-recognition and elephants. Now, you might ask, how do we know? How can you tell? And that's, and that's an important question always to ask when one's drawing conclusions in science about an inner life that one doesn't have direct access to, right? You can't enter the, the mind you know, of an elephant and see the world through its eyes. Well, the main way that they test for this and draw the conclusion that an elephant has self-awareness is to do studies where they will put like two X's on an elephant's face in, in removable like paint. Um, so they're not harming the elephant. Um, one X will be visible. The other X will be invisible. Okay. They, they use visible and invisible so that the elephant can feel both. Okay. Then they show the elephant a mirror. They show the elephant, the image of the elephant in the mirror. The elephant gets to look at itself. And what they find consistently is the elephant's trunk will go to the visible X and, and will sometimes groom it, sometimes try to remove it. But it knows that what it's seeing in the mirror is something applicable to itself. And that, again, is, is a measure of self-awareness. Very few animals do that. The elephant does. So again, in the literature, in the scientific literature, it's interpreted as being a, an indicator of self-awareness. The concept of the self, and this sort of connects with things that we've discussed philosophically, the concept of the self is central in the history of philosophy and in the contemporary exploration, like in my work, of the conditions of philosophical rigor, right? In the sense that we cannot leave the world to view it. We are committed to encountering the world from where we stand. Right? That is central to Einstein's work in physics, central to Heisenberg's work in developing quantum mechanics, the uncertainty principle, the notion that we have to come to terms with experience rigorously. And the rigorous confrontation with experience is, in a sense, the existential confrontation from where we are. Well, and where are we fundamentally? Where our self is. We are seeing the world in relation to our self. The, in fact, the, the notion that we can leave ourselves behind and see the world from the outside as if we were seeing an independently existing reality, which is the basic worldview that science enters. Things. It's scientists sort of undertake and exploring what they term objective reality. Well, that's, that's a heuristic. That's not rigorously achievable or substantiatable in the same way that we can't rigorously substantiate that other human beings have the same experience of color, of the color blue or the color red as we do. We, we assume it, we're convinced of it because of the, the strength of the heuristic space that we occupy. But philosophy demands that we come to terms with epistemic space, the true rigor of our circumstance, of what we can legitimately 
inexorably, incontestably. Well, in terms of, again, the, the connection between you know, selfhood, elephant's sense of self, and, and what it suggests in terms of what it brings to mind in terms of the of philosophy itself and the history of philosophy, I just, again, we've explored some of these issues in the past, but remember the most famous admonition in the history of philosophy, going back to the time of ancient Greece, the birthplace of Western philosophy is that of the Delphic Oracle, know thyself. And Aristotle himself emphasized that the beginning of wisdom, the source of wisdom ultimately is knowledge of the self. So again, we see the connection, right, between an animal with a sense of self um, that is, is celebrated, you know, religiously um, in, in psychoanalytic, you know, sort of literature, but that because of a sense of self also intersects, you know, fundamental like preoccupations and concerns in the history of philosophical thought. The, um, okay, let me just see something here. Okay, now, even though we're talking as a motivating element for the talk about elephants and that, that, that Buddhist text that begins and to memoirs, I now want to talk a little bit more about wisdom per se. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about Will Durant. Will Durant was a celebrated 20th century American philosopher, but primarily historian. Um, he's come up also in these talks in the past. He wrote a, a many volume story of civilization you know, a history of civilization that he mostly worked on with his wife, Ariel. Um, uh, Durant was originally a professor at Columbia University in New York. Um, his wife-to-be was a student of his. Um, they got along famously, and they ended up collaborating on mammoth historical undertakings for decades. In the 1920s, Durant gave a celebrated series of lectures on the great philosophers in New York City. The, the talks would first address biographical details of the philosophers' lives, and these philosophers included you know, Plato, Aristotle, Leibniz, Nietzsche, you know, the, what he considered to be, and what most of us consider to be the greatest, you know, of philosophers in the Western philosophical tradition. The second half of each lecture would be devoted to the ideas, you know, of those philosophers. The, the talks were, were widely attended. They were among the most popular, you know, events in the 1920s in New York. Um, it was maybe the last time that philosophy has drawn large public audiences. Part of it was how engaging, you know, Will Durant was, but especially how engaging he was in terms of addressing biographical details, you know, of the lives of these individuals to humanize them. When, when I was in, in high school, as a senior in high school, I took a course that was offered in my high school on philosophy. It was a philosophy course. Um, and the text for that course was a book that was assembled from those lectures um, and called The Story of Philosophy. If you want sort of a, a basic introduction to uh, the main ideas of, of a lot of important figures in the history of Western philosophy, and especially an introduction to biographical aspects of 
the lives of these philosophers, I still recommend it. It's considered a classic. Now, when actually I was taking that class and, and, and reading that book, I had, at that point, I mentioned this before, been reading a lot of philosophy. So I had actually read most of the original you know, texts that Will Durant was drawing upon. So I was more interested in the biographical aspects you know, from that book, not Durant's philosophical assessment. And, and, and again, Durant has, I think, more value historically as a biographer and as a historian than as a philosopher. And, and, and to give it a sense of that, the introduction to Durant's story of philosophy contains a statement about how he believed epistemology, the investigation of how we know and if we know what we think we know, which is central to the work of Socrates and really the entire Western philosophical tradition since Socrates and central to my work. It's why I call like philosophic space, rigorous space, epistemic space to relate it to epistemology, an investigation of legitimate claims to knowledge. Well, Durant in the introduction decried um, criticized the role of epistemology in Western philosophy, in contemporary philosophy, feeling that it had kidnapped like, philosophy and its major concerns, which should be not the investigation of the nature of knowledge um, that we thought was maybe more a psychological enterprise, but philosophy should be focused upon the synthesis of broad aspects of human experience to achieve wisdom. Now, when you hear synthesis, you think convergence. So quite honestly, I would represent Durant's vision of philosophic wisdom as more heuristic than epistemic. Now, Clearly, by dismissing or arguing against the central role and the vital role of epistemology, Durant's thinking went in a very different direction from mine. For, for me, and I have lots of aphorisms that I've cited in the past, the investigation of the nature of knowledge and the establishment of the incontrovertible you know, represents not just the essence of philosophy, not just the essence of philosophical rigor, but the key to wisdom, the key to, again, understanding the logical basis for what religions strive for, but through belief or faith. So for me, the epistemological, the investigation of the nature of our claims to know is the path, the ultimate path, the rigorous path to the highest level of wisdom, the wisdom that ultimately, again, achieves what religions have aspired to at their highest or at their deepest. You know, propositions, aphorisms like, we suffer not because of what we know and not because of what we do not know and not because of what we cannot know, but because of what we think we know unjustifiably. That, for me, represents the ultimate distillation of wisdom, the strongest possible response to our circumstances, that if you are suffering, if you are in pain, if you are in despair, if you are experiencing any negativity, physical or psychological or emotional, you are ultimately in operating within the presuppositions of heuristic space. You are not seeing the epistemic space that is able to liberate one from those 
oppressions, the oppressions of the heuristic that constrain us. It's, you know, we've talked about how, you know, the truth will set you free, being one of the prominent proclamations in the history of religious thought. Well, philosophic thought is rigorously divergent. It frees us from the oppressions of convergent space, where things are approximately the same, rigorously different. Um, other aphorisms that relate you know, to that issue, we suffer that we presume more than we know to the end of time. And, and it applies to my analysis discussion of the mythology of Eden, that, that Eden, its logic, what is most significant about it in terms of an ideal space, Eden is a landscape of philosophical rigor. Now that is a convergent proposition. I'm converging a mythology, a religious mythology, a religious representation with something philosophic and rigorous. But what I'm saying is that what, what Eden is, what we aspire for in Eden is achieved through rigorous philosophical analysis. Durant did say, um, science gives us knowledge, but only philosophy gives us wisdom. Yes, but again, the form in which and the manner in which philosophy gives us that wisdom is, in my estimation, different than what Durant imagined it to be. For me, the wisdom that is achieved is achieved through philosophical rigor. Now, there was a time when I was in college, um, but majoring in philosophy at Harvard, a department that ran counter to the general direction of Will Durant's thought. When I met Will Durant and his wife, Ariel, at the Hollywood Bowl one summer in Los Angeles, um, I had um, gone to the Hollywood Bowl to a classical concert. <clears throat> I didn't have a ticket. I was going to buy one. Um, and you know, at the box office, these concerts were not well attended, so there were always extra tickets. Um, but as I was walking towards the bo box office, somebody approached me. They saw that I was alone, and they asked me you know, if I needed a ticket. Um, Yes, I did. Um, they, they gave me a ticket free, and it turned out to be one of the better seats at the Hollywood Bowl, not a seat that I would have purchased, you know, if I was going to buy a ticket myself, it would have been expensive. Um, but I ended up sitting in one of the box seat areas. Um, the person who gave me the ticket was somebody who went to the Hollywood Bowl on a regular basis. And, and you know, as we were talking before the concert began. You know, I was explaining to him I was studying philosophy, you know. Um, and, he's, and he pointed out to me a few boxes away, the Durants. He said, you know, they, they came every Tuesday and Thursday, you know, to the Hollywood Bowl, and why don't you go over and introduce yourself? Well, I did. <laughs> now, they looked, this was towards the end of their, of their life, they, they had grown, I think, to resemble each other remarkably, um, even more than in that photograph. Um, Ariel Durand did not say anything. Um, the entire conversation that I had was with Will Durand. And, and I was, you know, I congratulated him on, on his, his achievements, on his and his career, um, told him a little bit about, you know, having read the story of philosophy and, and what I had taken away from it, and especially about, you know, a lot of the biographical um, insights that he provided. Um, and then we talked a little bit about, you know, my studying philosophy at Harvard in a, an analytical philosoph 
you know, philosophy department that, again, did not embrace the ideas that he was most drawn to philosophically. Um, and unfortunately, that seemed to bring the conversation to a somewhat premature conclusion. I could tell that he wasn't really interested in you know, that direction of contemporary thought. But again, um, I recommend the story of philosophy as an introduction, not just to you know, the subject, but to the lives you know, of many of the great philosophers in the Western tradition. Now, as I've been stressing with Durant, a lot of his value is not just his, in terms of his writing of history, but in terms of his writing of biography. There are some biographical sort of comments, actually, that, that come to mind as I'm thinking back on the experience of reading that book in high school. Um, when he, he talked about Plato, he described how at the end of his life, Plato um, went to a party. Um, there was a lot of drinking. Um, he was you know, worshipped you know, by, you know, by his students, by the citizens of Athens. Um, at some point um, during, during the party, during the festivities, he got tired and he, he went to take a little nap um, from which he never awakened. And, um, and Durand commented that in the course of the night that little sleep became an eternal one and that all Athens followed him to the grave. All Athens went to his funeral. He was a celebrated figure in Athenian society. Um, another biographical detail that stands out is in his description of the life of Voltaire. The, enlight the French Enlightenment philosopher, um, someone who railed against religion, feeling that religion you know, was mostly superstition, did not embrace religion. Voltaire was a rationalist. Um, well, at the end of his life, he was celebrated you know, throughout France, throughout Europe. Um, and even though it was recognized, you know, that his, his writings had represented a rejection, you know, of religious belief. He, he was given Catholic rights, Catholic last rites. And Durant commented, and he, was, and he was even buried, I think, in a Catholic cemetery. And Durant commented that rules were not made for geniuses, not like Voltaire. And, and he, he also commented that on Voltaire's tombstone, only three words were needed. And I give the English, here lies Voltaire. And, and finally, <clears throat> I remember at the end of um, Durant's discussion of Nietzsche, 19th century German philosopher, who had actually ended up his life institutionalized. He, um, purportedly suffered from syphilis, and syphilis can cause uh, mental decay, and it did cause dementia in, 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 in the case of Nietzsche. Um, so even at, towards the end of his life, he was, he was close with his sister, his sister cared for him, um, and there was, I don't know, she mentioned something about someone's philosophical writings, philosophical works, and Nietzsche had a moment of illumination that Durant refers to, and, and, and Nietzsche said, I, I too have written some good books, but he didn't remember that always. Um, and Durant actually closes his, his chapter on Nietzsche by commenting that no one ever paid so great a price for genius. So again, just to give you a sense, a flavor of the biography that um, Durant brought to his exploration of the wisdom 
that philosophers brought to the world. Biography is also celebrated in the work of Samuel Johnson, that um, English man of letters who wrote the first English dictionary. He was a moral philosopher, uh, but he also wrote an 18th century moral philosopher, uh, but he also wrote lives of, well, lives of the poets, um, a celebrated um, series of biographies of great poets within the English tradition. Samuel Johnson was himself the subject of what's considered the greatest biography ever written. Um, it's a biography written by a close friend of his, James Boswell, who followed Johnson religiously. And after you know, extended conversations that the two of them would have or socializings, Boswell would retire and, and scrupulously write out everything he could recall in detail of the conversations and the exchanges. A lot of Samuel Johnson's rep rep um, <clears throat> his reputation as one of the great talkers, one of the great conversationalists, just like Moreau, is based upon that work by James Boswell. Johnson considered biography to be the most valuable of all genre, of all categories of literature, because it was the best guide to life. It provided through giving examples you know, of people's experiences, how they coped, how they responded to challenges. It was for Johnson the best guide to a kind of practical wisdom. So he encouraged the reading of biography in the same way as he himself engaged in the reading of biography. Johnson was very much interested in achieving like wisdom. But what, what, what the mind could, could do in terms of coming to terms with the challenges of human life, which Johnson felt were almost insuperable. He felt that life was a difficult, an arduous journey, even for someone as gifted intellectually as Samuel Johnson. So his moral philosophy is focused upon what can help us deal with all of the challenges, the, the, the despairs, the disappointments, the suffering you know, that life entails. His poetry also was what we call didactic, was interested in teaching lessons about how to cope, was interested in conveying what Johnson felt was the wisdom that was available to us from religious traditions, from, from great minds operating upon experience, as Samuel Johnson termed it. Well, one of his most celebrated poems, probably his single most famous poem, is a work called The Vanity of Human Wishes. It ends, it's a, it's a long poem, like 10 pages long in, in most versions, but it ends with a, a summary, a distillation of the kind of responses to human life that for Samuel Johnson constituted wisdom. Now, keep in mind, Johnson was not what we would call, you know, an academic philosopher, and, and he certainly was not seeing philosophy in its epistemological dimension, in its epistemic dimension, that term didn't exist, um, and was not seeing philosophy as the limit of rigor. That's something that, that I emphasize in my work. But so there's, well, you'll see. Let me read to you the very end of Johnson's Vanity of Human Wishes, the last eight or 10 lines, and, and you'll see what constitutes for a moral philosopher of the rank of Samuel Johnson, which is the highest rank you know, in the realm of moral philosophy, what constituted wisdom for him. So, and it's a poem. Um, 
Poems are always a little bit challenging, but it's a didactic poem. So Johnson is interested in communicating his insights and understanding. And it goes like this. So he's, you know, he's considered, you know, in the previous, you know, nine pages of the poem, the challenges of human life. And now he's come down to what can help us? What should we do, okay, um, to deal with this challenging, often desperate experience that we need to confront? Well, he says, pour forth thy fervors for a healthful mind. Basically, if we're going to pray for help, he was a, a, a deist, a theist. He believed in, in, in a divinity. Um, pour forth thy fervors for a healthful mind, obedient passions, and a will resigned. A will resigned. That's a stoic response to experience where we're not, we're accepting of what we cannot change about the world. For love, which scarce collective man can fill. For patience, sovereign or transmuted ill. For faith, that panting for a happier seat counts death, kind nature's signal of retreat. In, in religious traditions often, it's, it's the afterlife, right? That represents the more perfect domain. This is a realm of suffering that we transcend you know, in death. These goods for man, the laws of heaven ordain. These goods he grants, who grants the power to gain. With these celestial wisdom calms the mind and makes the happiness she does not find. Now, notice a few interesting things about that. He has a series of ingredients, you know, to a wise response to experience. At, he, he feels that, that to be happy one needs health, one needs to be obedient, you know, to control one's passions, one's emotions, resign one's will, accept one's circumstances, love insofar as one can, be patient insofar as one can, have faith, you know, in what a religious tradition promises. Again, we have a series of convergent elements being brought together in a picture of what wisdom amounts to. It's more heuristic than rigorously philosophic. And notice it's, it's at a slightly lower level than the kind of religious salvation that religions are aspiring to at their extremity. You know, a complete solution here and now mystical union with God, you know, a, a Buddhist enlightenment in which disease, old age, and death banish a rigorous philosophic solution where everything that is, is engaged with suffering is heuristic, and that's not the ultimate reality. Right? So it's at a lower level of embrace. This leads me to an encounter I had as a freshman, actually during my first week um, as a freshman at Harvard, um, freshman orientation. Now, a few weeks ago when I was talking about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I talked about an encounter I had during freshman orientation with Edwin Reichauer, the later's ambassador to Japan, right, during the 1960s, who talked about, you know, the considerations that went into the dropping of those bombs. The other professor that I met with during that week was John Finley. John Finley was a celebrated professor of classics, one of the most admired professors at Harvard, admired in particular for his wisdom, for the wisdom that he had accumulated through a very long life and through patient study of 
the world's great classical literature, the classics of, of, of Greece in particular. Well, he talked to us in this little group setting. It was me and maybe eight, nine other students, maybe fewer, I don't really remember, because I was so focused upon what John Finley was saying. And in particular, he was talking about Oedipus Rex, the great play by Sophocles. In Oedipus Rex, Oedipus um, is king of Thebes. He became king of Thebes by solving the riddle of the Sphinx. The, the riddle of the Sphinx was a riddle, um, what walks on four legs in the morning, three, two in the afternoon, and three at night. And the answer is a human being, man, right? As an infant, we crawl. As an adult, we walk on two legs. As we are old, we may use a cane. Okay, so um, that the solving of that riddle um, represented a kind of power of mind, right? To deal with political issues, political challenges. After that success, um, Oedipus's life encounters a tragic fall. Turns out that he was a man of pride. You know, he was proud partly because of that accomplishment. He felt that, that he was a man of vision and understanding, someone who could see through, you know, the surface of things. Well, he couldn't. What he, he didn't see was that a man that he encountered, you know, on a, on a road earlier in his life was his father and he killed him. And what he didn't see was that the woman that was queen of Thebes that he would marry was actually his mother because he'd been given up as a child. So he didn't know his parents. Well, the fact that he killed his father and married his mother led to his demise. And when he realized the truth of his situation, which, well, he was in Thebes, um, a plague overtook the city. There was an earlier plague that had ended when he solved the riddle of the Sphinx, but now there was a new plague that arose because Oedipus was king having had perpetrated these horrific crimes. Right? At some point, he realizes you know, what he has done. And when he realizes that, he blinds himself. He becomes then a blind seer. He becomes what Tiresias, this, this seer, this person who can see, you know, like into things, into the, the true nature, meaning, reality of things. He becomes that type of individual. And Finley made the distinction between worldly wisdom and final wisdom. Worldly wisdom was what Oedipus exhibited when he solved the riddle of the Sphinx. Again, it's the wisdom of practicalities, the wisdom of survival, the wisdom of power in, in the world, you know, like of, of, of daily circumstances. Final wisdom is an understanding in, in the Greek tradition of the ways of the gods, of what's really operating behind the surface, behind the, 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 the more superficial aspects of the world, the ultimate reality. Understanding that ultimate reality is final wisdom. Understanding how to get by in the world worldly wisdom. Obviously, final wisdom is higher, more deeper, it's more significant, it's more profound, it's more compelling, it's our ultimate goal. Worldly wisdom is what we would call, what I would call heuristic. Final wisdom is epistemic. Now, 
In the case of the Greek tradition, final wisdom represented a connection with the ways of the gods. Obviously, within you know, philosophy, you know, that doesn't rise to the level of rigorous representation. But the basic notion, the basic distinction between worldly and final, heuristic, which facilitates survival, and epistemic, which facilitates, again, what religions imagine describing salvation, uh, pertains to that distinction that Finley was making. The, and actually, there is a poem that I wrote in relation to Oedipus. I'm going to not recite it. I haven't memorized it. I'm going to read it. Um, now, I've made the point whenever I deal with poetry that the sound matters, especially with contemporary poetry. Um, it's not like listen to normal sentences, you know, of text, of prose. It's highly concentrated. And for me in particular, when I write poems, it's the music, you know, of the poetry that conveys the meaning as much as the literal sort of sequence of words. But just to give you the, the sound, you know, that emerged from that encounter with Finley and that distinction between worldly and final wisdom in relation to Oedipus. It's a short poem. And here it is. It's titled Oedipus. And again, focus on the music of it. Time, time in her prime cannot chime a nursery rhyme. Never mind the fine design Line by line, we're out of time. Yours or mine cannot find what would bind all humankind. Day by day, come what may, Oedipus is blind. Okay, so there. Now, as, as we discussed, I write in different forms, in different formats. Um, the poetry I write usually is focused on the tragic, the heuristic dimensions of experience. The philosophical aphorisms that I write um, in general tend to answer, you know, those tragic aspects of experience. So, worldly versus final wisdom, heuristic versus epistemic. The enterprise of philosophy the philosophy that I do, that I elaborate, is focused upon final wisdom. And that final wisdom, the path to that final wisdom is rigor, right? The incontestable, right? That, that, and, and, and rigor can be represented as, as difference, right? Rigor is a difference. Any two things are approximately the same for some purpose, for purposes of technology or society or, or, or politics, but rigorously different. And it's the rigor that frees us from the belief that what applies to one thing need apply to another, including all of our notions of mortality. But again, these philosophical rigor is an extreme response, an extreme solution that it functions successfully only at its limit, at its limit of precision. Now, I've also talked about the value of biography, at least juristically, in moving us in a certain direction to appreciate, well, we can actually often appreciate epistemic enterprises um, biographically. That was one of the things that I was interested in, in achieving in the books of Joshua, which is autobiographical. I mean, I have a, an alter ego, a character, Joshua, that, that really is me, but um, I'm, focused on, in that 
in a fictional guise, the guise of this character, Joshua, um, my basic intellectual development, the things that, that motivated me emotionally, the issues of human life, its, 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 its dark aspects, its challenges, um, what motivated me towards a philosophical representation, a philosophical solution. What motivated me from the heuristic experience to the epistemic rigor. And in the books of Joshua, I represent this process poetically, but in a different, with a different kind of poetry, a narrative poetry. And I want to read you a slight section from the books of Joshua that deals with the undertaking when I was young, a teenager, to move towards the epistemic as a philosophical enterprise to achieve the wisdom that philosophy is capable of embracing, but again, at its limit of rigor. So here's from the books of Joshua, the philosophical enterprise towards wisdom, but a wisdom of rigor. And then a girl from Oz appeared and waved her magic wand, a second muse to guide him to enchantment and beyond. She taught him how to read the patterns in a rippled pond, as at the moment of creation and every moment on. Under her spell, he learned to dwell in rhythm and in rhyme and to assess each pregnant stress in the silences of time. Induction became a recurring concern, how we can know the future, how we can ever learn, and how we can escape the imaginings of fate, what we know and what, to, and what we sow, and what to sow, what we can assume, and every mode of exit from a cloistered room, the tragic vision of the world and certainty of doom, and the climate and the soil that Eden needs to bloom. Well, that climate, that soil, is the climate, the soil of philosophical rigor, right? That, that, that position where we suffer not because of what we know, not because of what we do not know, not because of what we cannot know, but because of what we only think we know in every direction, unjustifiably. And, and eliminating those not rigorous claims positions us in that landscape of Eden, that epistemic space that, again, religions have sought, that, that Buddhism imagined in, in processes that were designed to eliminate concepts, concepts of disease, old age, and death, but through a process that we've discussed in the past that is not purely rigorous. And so Buddhism is ultimately a religion, not a philosophical response, explication of problems of human, of human suffering. Now, the... A lot of these issues I dealt with in a movie that I wrote and that I kind of basically did myself. Um, it's, it's called Torture. Um, again, I've talked about it at some point in the past. It was a film done in response to a series of, of, of murders, um, horrific murders, um, but the film itself is not graphic. Um, it doesn't depict violence. Um, but because of the title, Torture, because of how I introduce it, um, you know what's going to be happening. Okay. And so you know that this is a film about 
victims being tortured to death, even though you don't see the actual violence. Now, the point of this movie was to put you inside the mind of first the torturer, but most importantly, the victim. And while you're inside the mind of that victim, there's music, there's a continuous soundtrack that is beautiful at the, at the limits of beauty in terms of what the Western musical tradition has produced that was intentional. Um, it also displays throughout the film in, in panels, like short quotations, excerpts from powerful responses within religious traditions, philosophic traditions, literary traditions to the problem of human suffering in the extreme. And, and so the question you ask yourself, the way this is designed to be done is, you know this is a film about torture, you know that that's what's happening in the background, and, and the question then becomes, are these responses enough? Do they rise to the level of that circumstance, that horrific circumstance? Do they, do they quell any of the emotional anguish that you're feeling as you're imagining this experience, this state? Now, early on when I would write philosophy, I would always imagine myself in some horrific set of circumstances. I would imagine myself burned, you know, like with third degree burns over most of my body. I would imagine myself buried alive. I would imagine myself out in space drifting, you know, to my death. And then I would say to myself, once I imagined that clearly enough, okay, now write philosophy because only philosophy that can rise to the level of those challenges is to me worthwhile at all. Well, that was the same thing I was doing in this film. And most of the early things that I used were again from philosophical and religious traditions. The later things represented a distillation of some of my work. So let me just read you some of these because they summarize like a lot of what has gone for wisdom within a lot of the world's cultures. So first of all, the, the film begins with a quotation also from Andre Malraux's Anton Mount Mars, but from the end of his book. Um, and the quotation is, the dialogue of the human animal with torture is more profound than that of man with death. Then I start introducing, and, and just so you see, like there's what the poster for the film looks like, okay? Um, but then I start introducing, you know, some responses, literary philosophical responses in, in panels. And, and I'm gonna read some of these to you just, again, so you can see what has counted as wisdom within much of the world's cultures. So, for example, first of all, from Confucius's Analects, one world at a time. For me, that's one of the most profound things that Confucius ever wrote. He was asked, what about death? What about, you know, what's beyond this world, this life? Confucius' response was, one world at a time. That's an epistemic response. We deal with our circumstances here and now, not speculation as to what might come next. There is from, there's a Hindu lullaby that I've referred to in the past. Child, you are yourself when you sleep and when you dream and even when you are awake. Look at the world going by. Again, that points to the epistemic that we cannot leave our experience and view the world from the outside. Um, it's a kind of epistemic response. The question, again, you have to ask yourself as you're imagining, you know, a circumstance of being tortured to death is, is that enough? Does that help? Does that work? 
um, some others um, from Hamlet by Shakespeare. Men must endure their going hence, even as they're coming hither. Ripeness is all. Again, one of the supreme philosophical statements in Shakespeare, one of the, the, the ultimate representations and expressions of Shakespearean wisdom. A few more, Mark Twain, life is dream, dream better dreams. Now, here's one that actually is part of my philosophical response, just to give you a sense. And it goes, there's a character in the film called the blind philosopher. Um, he sings this to the main character. Two is not equal to one is an answer for everyone. Eden is where you find it in colors of dreams. I tell you nothing means what you think it means. I tell you nothing is as it seems. Okay. Then a few others, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, a medieval Christian um, writer. Um, my teachers are the apostles. They have taught me to live. Do you think it a little thing to know how to live? Blind philosopher again. If it becomes an oak tree, it was an acorn. If it becomes Mozart, it was embryonic genius. The future decides the past. Siddhartha, the Buddha. Even so, brethren, have I found an ancient road, an ancient path, trodden by Buddhas of a bygone age, to which having followed, I understand life and its coming to be and its passing away, and thus understanding, I have declared the same. That was what I had on my the door to my room when I was a teenager. Just those words consoled me. Is that strong enough? And finally, towards the end of the film, the main character, Emily, again, undergoing this horrific fate, to exquisitely beautiful music is chanting some aphoristic formulations based on my philosophical work. And again, the question is, does this work? Not as it seems in life and dreams, not as it seems in life and dreams, not as it seems in life and dreams. Or another, is it a spell too soon to tell? Is it a spell too soon to tell? Is it a spell too soon to tell? The real is to come, not yet begun. The real is to come, not yet begun. The real is to come, not yet begun. Pain is decay, we cannot say. Pain is decay, we cannot say. Pain is decay, we cannot say. And then finally, a, a sort of an overall summary of my philosophical perspective at the time of the movie, which was some years ago, to see life as dream is the starting point of philosophy and the halfway point back to Eden. So it's a matter of seeing beyond the horror of the experience, seeing, being able to see the experience in such a way that you can strip it of its horror. Okay. Um, I wanted to conclude by going back to the animal kingdom. Um, I like squirrels. Before I became friends with local squirrels, I had some hamsters, this is some years ago. Um, and I wrote a poem um, about hamster philosophy. Again, it's highly concentrated. Um, the sound matters as much or more than anything else. Um, I wanted to just read you this. I mean, we started with elephants. Um, we will end with hamsters. Um, and let me just get the poem. Okay, so the scientific term for a hamster, the, the family of animals to which a hamster belongs, is, let me just get the poem. 
Um, one second here. Is Christetony. Christetony. Okay? So the title of this poem is Christetony. And it goes In hamster philosophy, the hamster cannot see so much as a scintilla past clarities of certainty. And so did wisdom come to be early in a family tree, the prerogative of Christetony. And the emphasis there is on clarities of certainty, that that is the focus of philosophy, of philosophical rigor, that for philosophy is the ultimate wisdom, is the final wisdom that John Finley was speaking of, that is the wisdom that is strong enough at the limit of rigor to address all of the challenges of human life. Okay, so um, that will conclude today's talk on wisdom in relation to International Elephant Day. Now I want to go and address the questions from last time. We had four questions. Um, they were good questions, as the questions usually are. And let me say some things about them. OK, so let me pull them up. OK, first question. Um, for seeing that you need to have a big, for seeing that you need to have a big fantasy and imagination. Do you agree? Um, seeing, when we're talking philosophically, we're talking about seeing the epistemic, right? Now, notice when I was talking about some of those um, lines in, in, in torture, I talked about seeing life as dream, right? That's what um, Mark Twain thought was a response, the ultimate wisdom. You know, life is dream, dream better dreams. Well, I say at the very end, to see life as dream is the starting point of philosophy and the halfway point back to Eden. So that's a matter of seeing. The philosophers Nietzsche, and Schopenhauer, those 19th century German philosophers, wrote, in fact, that the ability to see life, at least occasionally as dream, is the most important ingredient in the philosophical orientation to the world. That if you're going to be doing philosophy, you have to at least occasionally be able to see life as dream. And and that takes some imagination. Now, what specifically in the nature of imagination does that take? Well, the simplest way to do that is to be able to imagine that the world as we experience it, the world that we're experiencing right now, can take in a moment, in an hour, in a day, a radically different form. If the world goes in a radically different direction, to anything we've experienced up till now, then we will conclude that this was dream. And being able to imagine that is one way to imagine the world itself as dream. And yes, so it's a, it's a function of, of an imagination, of an ability to imagine things taking a very different course than our expectations. Now, second question. What else may help to transform your understanding? Okay, another very good question. Um, it's a heuristic enterprise that I'm going to lay out, um, but the heuristic can ultimately lead to the epistemic that is the point of this last formulation here. The heuristic converges to the epistemic. And the heuristic is, the epistemic is the strongest of all heuristics. That's what Einstein and Heisenberg used in the elaboration of their physics. Well, okay, so um, 
again, um, what can help transform your understanding of the world. First of all, um, one wants to practice seeing the world from different perspectives. Now, one can't validate you know, certain perspectives. One can't know for sure, for example, how somebody else is experiencing the world, but one can sort of play at it, can, can exercise one's capacities for imaginative reconstruction of the world from different perspectives, from different perspectives. Points. So, for example, um, when early on I was moving in the direction of my philosophical work, I would read novels. Great Expectations was a novel by Charles Dickens, a um, famous 19th century English novelist. Um, it was the first novel really where I did this religiously, you know, with real commitment to the process. And that was Every time a character spoke, I would try to imagine myself in the position of that character. So I would try to imagine the history of that character as I knew it. I would try to place myself in the perspective of that character, seeing what that character was seeing you know, within that novel you know, as I was reading, as I was encountering it. Now, it made for a very long process you know, of reading through this book. It took a long time, but it was an extraordinarily helpful exercise. Okay? It's, it's a little bit like that process of you know, trying you know, walking in someone else's shoes or imagining what that's like. Now, I've made the point often that we can't rigorously do that. And, and one of the reasons why we can't judge is because we cannot experience the world from someone else's perspective from inside you know, their shoes or their footsteps or their skin, right? We cannot ever do that. And even if we could do that for a bit, we would have to do that from the moment of their birth to legitimately have a sense of their world. But we can practice. We can, for example, um, as we're walking, we can imagine what it would be like to live in a given house, a given apartment that we might pass if we woke up to the world from that particular place and saw that street upon arising or, or saw that direction of sky or mountain or tree, landscape, whatever it is. These provide mental flexibility for allowing us to see things from different perspectives. One of the most valuable of those processes is to enter different religious and philosophical perspectives. When I was studying different religions, I would try to study them from the point where effectively I could imagine what it was to actually be a Buddhist or be a Christian or be Muslim. Like to sort of place myself sufficiently within that tradition, within that perspective, so I was convinced of it, at least for some moments of, of, of perspective. The um, philosopher Bertrand Russell, 20th century English philosopher, said that every six months or so, he would sort of challenge all of his beliefs, you know, kind of dismiss them and try to see the world anew without whatever the assumptions and presuppositions he had developed over time. Well, honestly, especially when I was writing a lot of philosophy, like you know, in recent years, 10 years, 20 years ago, I would literally do that every day. And even now, when I encounter the world, um, my, my first glance at it in the morning is, is a non-philosophic sort of encounter. Then I will sort of evaluate, you know, is the philosophy still valid today from these odds now? So that constant reevaluation, that constant seeing the world outside of whatever conclusions you might have have drawn, okay? That's 
again, some, an experience, an exercise that helps promote understanding. Yes. And then Maimonides, I've referred to Maimonides before, reverse everything you believe, you'll be closer to the truth than you currently are. It is helpful to do that periodically too. Now, philosophically, one doesn't embrace belief, right? Beliefs are heuristic. But insofar as one does entertain beliefs, that one is not sort of within a rigorous philosophical vision, then yes, Maimonides' admonition applies. Try reversing everything you believe. These are exercises that help move one in the direction of understanding and can transform one's understanding if one finds a, an orientation more compelling than what one had embraced previously. Okay, another question. The point is that many people can't analyze past experience or they just don't know their history or the history. What do you think? Okay, um, one comment about that, make sure we have some time, is that history is not a rigorous guide, okay? Um, that any, his, you know, we, 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 we hear, you know, we read, you know, those who do not know the past are condemned to repeat it. Well, the fact of the matter is history can be used to justify any course of action because there are always differences between some historical experience and contemporary experience. So history, again, or the study of history is a heuristic. It can help us gain perspective. Um, we can use it as an exercise um, to sort of come to terms with different aspects of the world, but the epistemic does not embrace historical analysis because it's not present. And so it can take any possible form from where we stand now. It doesn't rise to the level of rigor. And I know we're running out of time, so... Um, okay, final question. Sometimes objects disappear when we I have to put them in the wrong place um, where they must not be. What is your opinion? Okay, this is an extremely important question. Um, it turns out that every now and then we misplace on an object, right? Every now and then. Almost all the time we recover the object. I mean, every now and then, yes, we might lose something outside. I lost a set of keys once, you know, outside someone's house. I wasn't able to find them. I never found them again, okay? But most of the time when we lose things, we recover them, especially if we lose them, misplace them, right? In interior spaces. There was a time where I had lost a watch that an uncle had given me, a, 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 not so much a valuable watch, but a watch that was valuable in terms of its sentimental meaning. Lost it like on a couch. Lost it, well, it did not reappear after one year, after two years, but after three years, I found it again, buried somewhere in that couch that I thought I had looked, but I guess I didn't look quite in the place where it ended up being. Three years later, that watch reappeared. I found it. The same thing happened once in, in a car where I lost a cell phone. The car, the cell phone had gotten lost under my seat. I knew it was under the seat, but where I looked for it, it had shifted. It wasn't quite where I had thought it was. Three months later, I found it. Now, it turns out that most of the time when we lose things, we recover them. But if most of the time when we lost things, we never recovered them, our whole sense of physical objects would change. 
our whole sense of the world would change, we would then have the notion that objects can in fact just disappear. That is not our sense of physical objects, again, because most of the time when we lose things, we recover them. But if that were not the case, just that circumstance would be enough to change our whole sense of reality, our whole sense of the world. Okay, we are now out of time. I see Leah's here, thank you. Super, so thank you very much, uh, Stephen, for being here with us every Friday for organizing these philosophical talks. We really appreciate it all. Also, we would like to give big thanks to our audience. Thank you very much. We see all the comments. We see that you're viewing all the likes. Thank you very much. Also, uh, so far, we have a comment from Katrina. She is an active participant of our philosophical talks. Yes. Hello, Katrina. Very happy to see you. As well, we have Sharon Gold, who was with us today. Oh, yes. So she has a comment. Hello, everyone. Mr. Friedman, thank you for the great topic today. It's actually so interesting how obscure the world of animals is. We know so few of animals, and yet they seem to be more wise than human beings. Okay. Yes. That's a very good comment. So far, we don't have any questions, but you know that our live session will be on our Facebook page Please feel free to type in your questions there. I will address and give, give them to Stephen. So he'll address them next week. One more time, thank you very much, Stephen, for being with us. Thank you, the audience, and big thanks to the U.S. Consulate General here in Almaty, American Space Almaty. Please stay safe, join us, join us next week, and have a great week. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. I hope to see you next time.